Hello, welcome to the 10th uh, session of our uh, lectures on introduction to human geography. And today we're going to deal with industrialization, activities in the developed and developing countries, as well as the geography of manufacturing in Ghana. So for our session overview, we'll look at um, the classification of industries identify the factors that enhances or constrains the location of industry, to describe some key in the, uh, industrial location theories, show the differences in the nature of manufacturing industries in the advanced and developing countries, highlight on the role of small-scale industries in the developing economies, discuss industrialization in Ghana during colonial and post-colonial periods, and discuss the role of manufacturing in the economy of Ghana, identify the trends in policy and strategy towards the manufacturing sector, and identify patterns of uh, manufacturing activities in Ghana. Uh, it appears this is a very packed uh, session uh, in terms of the goals and objectives. Um, for the outline uh, the topics that we'll look at is what is industrialization, just to highlight on what industrialization means. Um, and then from there we'll look at the factors that affect uh, location of industries. Every industry is located uh, in a place for several reasons and then we in this course will try to understand some of the factors that would um, attract the location uh, of a particular industry or deter a company from not uh, locating in a certain area. Um, and having or in the attempt to understand this uh, I think it's also important for us to also understand certain theories that would uh, contribute in or try to help us to understand uh, the location of uh, industries in places. And when we finished with that, we'll look at industrialization in the developing world, and then go further to describe industrialization in Ghana, and then conclude with a summary of uh, whatever we're going to talk about today. Yeah, so for our readings, uh, these are the recommended uh, texts that you're supposed to read. The first one is uh, by Fulberg, which you are all familiar with. Fulberg, Murphy, and De Bly, Human Geography, People, Place, and Culture. And the other one is uh, by Youngson PWK, published in 2013. And the title is Aspects of Geography of Manufacturing in Ghana. So, what is industrialization? Um, we can say that industrialization is a process whereby industrial activity, particularly manufacturing, assumes a greater importance in the economy of a country or region. And it's widely thought to be a basic dimension of development. If you look at most of the advanced countries, they are what they are because of industrialization. Uh, many of them used to be agrarian, you know, they produced uh, food on the farms and then made a living out of it. But with the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, these countries have become richer and richer. And as a result of that, for the much of the 20th century, most developing countries perceive or believe that they can also become rich or develop through industrialization. So it's seen as a very important thing in uh, human development. Uh, it creates benefits in the form of economic wealth and higher standards of living. You know, in all these uh, rich countries, you could see that the, the citizens of these uh, countries have a very higher standard of living, and then they also have health. They live long, they can afford to by almost everything that they need. Uh, however, industrialization also generates uh, environmental pollution, ecological damage, exhaustion of the non-renewable resources, and excessive reliance of vast supplies of energy. If I'm saying this, what does it mean? Uh, for environmental pollution, you could see that many of these industries 
um, pollute the environment, you know, with all the uh, smoke that are coming from the chimneys, you know, pollutes the environment. Some of them would have to extract resources from the earth, and in that process, they tend to pollute the environment, and then that causes uh, ecological damage because some of the uh, biological lives of uh, or uh, living things, you know, ten, uh, especially vegetation, tend to die, or even um, water resources tend to die through this process. And also, there are certain resources that are used in industrialization that are not renewable, like oil. You know, when oil is extracted uh, day in and day out. We, we, we don't tend to replace them, so they, they tend to become non-renewable resources. So the more industries depend on oil, for example, it causes a lot of um, uh, environmental issues. And when all these things are taking place, then it means that the earth surface is the one that suffers. So although industrialization has its good sides, it also has its negative uh, sides. Now that we've understood what is industrialization, we need to look at industries. So the question is, what is an industry? In a wider sense, an industry is any work or activity undertaken to gain and that, uh, to promote employment. So the kind of activities that we're talking about could be agricultural activities. It could be manufacturing. It could be retailing. Right, and this is uh, according to Rhetoric et al. 2001. Also, CAR 1990 uh, indicates us that industry is a term, besides referring to manufacturing, can also uh, be used to refer to other economic activities such as mining, construction, provision of public utilities such as water and electricity. In actual fact, uh, it, uh, it's basically saying the same thing as uh, Rhetoric et al., you know, in terms of uh, context. And in this lecture, our main focus will be on manufacturing. As much as we know that there are other uh, activities which are not based on manufacturing, our focus on industri uh, industries will be on manufacturing activities. So in this sense, we need to understand the classification of industries, you know, what uh, we mean by the different types of industries. So first we have the primary industries. And what are primary industries? They are occupations of economic activities that are concerned with the production of materials provided by nature. So primary activities could be farming, it could be fishing, uh, it could be forestry, it could be mining or quarrying, you know, things that are taken directly from the earth. And then the secondary industry, usually referred to as manufacturing, that's what we're focusing on, consists of occupations which process the raw materials provided by primary industries into more useful commodities. And these type of industries can be divided into two. We can have the light industry and heavy industries. So uh, if you go to town and you find um, a company that is producing, for example, pens or plastic bottles. These are light industries. But then, if we're talking about the heavy industries, these are the ones that are, for example, producing ships, cars, trains. And examples of manufacturing industries generally could be steel making, construction, furniture uh, making, and also the automobile industry, which I mentioned earlier on. Yeah, so the third um, type of uh, industrial classification is the tertiary industry. And for the tertiary industry, it's about provision of services. And what are the kind of services that we're talking about? It could be uh, health. And those who provide these health services could be doctors and nurses. For education, it could be teachers like myself. Um, for other industries, it could be about providing utility services like electricity and water. It could also be transportation or entertainment. You all know uh, a lot of um, musicians or entertainment companies, and 
uh, this is uh, the job that they do is actually to provide services. The fourth one, which is um, quite new, um, as you can see on the slide, is a more recent type of high-tech industry involving providing information, such as uh, information services, such as computing, ICT, um, consultancy, engaging in research and development for companies and other institutions. And that one is called a quaternary industry. And it's sometimes um, also considered as a form of a tertiary industry due to the services that they provide to people. So for now, we would move to the factors of industrialization. And when we talk about the factors of industrialization, we mean factors that affect the location of industries. You know, as I said in the introduction part of uh, this uh, lecture, I said that there are certain factors that can determine or uh, kind of affect a company's location. And that's exactly what we're doing now. So what are the factors? The first factor is raw materials. Every industry requires raw materials. That is uh, any manufacturing industry. And um, when this thing is going to take place, um, in situations where the raw material needed is very bulky or heavy, these industries are interested in locating where the raw material is close to them because of the cost element. If it happens that the raw material um, is far away from where they are located, it means that they will have to spend a lot on transportation. And as you know, every business intends to maximize profit, get a lot of money from whatever they're doing. So to reduce their cost, they would intend to locate close to the source of raw material. Um, but proximity to raw material is not so important in the, to the location of industries today due to the improvement in transportation. But then there are also situations where people would tend to locate close to the market, you know, when their products are, um, generate a lot of weight at the, at the end of production. Um, examples of such industries are like the breweries. They use a lot of water, and um, at the end of the production, they are, the output becomes very heavy. So if they are, uh, they are located close to the source of raw material, transporting their outputs or the finished products to the market becomes very expensive for them. So they tend to locate close to the market rather than uh, locating close to the source of uh, raw material. Another a uh, factor that will determine the location of uh, any business is the site or the land on which that factory is going to be built. And for many um, businesses, they will look at whether the land is flat. They will look at uh, whether they, the, they can have a very firm foundation. So it means that the topography of the area is very important when you look at these two points. They would also look at whether the place is dry, free from flooding. They would also look at the cost element, whether the land is cheap or not. They will look at whether they can expand the space or whether they can have a permission to access that place or uh, in order to build their company. So large industrial plants such as steel manufacturing industries, for example, would prefer to have a flat land because most of their output or what they produce are very heavy. So if they are located on hilly places, it becomes a bit problematic for them. So they would always prefer to locate on flat lands. And the availability of land may therefore explain the spatial distribution of industries within any economy. Right, so if lands are available for people in any region or any country, you're able to see. Another factor is capital or finance. Um, capital is needed to acquire, for example, machinery, buy raw materials, pay uh, employees or workers. So it means that every company needs money. So without money, it will be very difficult for people to establish industries. 
and the availability of capital also explains why there are more heavy industries in the developed world than in the poor uh, countries. It's because in the advanced countries, they are able to access capital as compared to those living in the developing world. So with the availability of capital, they are able to establish very big or heavy industries. Uh, capital can also be borrowed locally or from international sources. So here in Ghana, you hear that people have gone to, let's say, the commercial bank to borrow money. At some point, you hear people have gone to the international markets to borrow money. But the key thing is that capital is a very important thing. Without capital, some businesses cannot take off. Yeah. So in the past, most industries were located near to coal fields as they relied on steam power. So what uh, it means is that these um, industries would always look out for where they can get a source of power for their industries. Uh, but today, most industries rely on electricity. So this means that there's no need to be located close to the source of power because electricity uh, runs on lines or cables. And you can be in Wale Wale or Tamale and still access the uh, power generated from the Akosombo Dam, which is in uh, the eastern part of the country. Uh, despite this change, some firms that need high amount of power, uh, for example, the aluminium uh, manufacturing companies, are still located close to the source of power. But it doesn't mean that they can't locate elsewhere. They can still locate far away from the source of power s since we are dependent mostly on electricity in uh, recent times or modern times. Um, another factor is uh, labor supply. Um, for industries, different uh, types of uh, labor are required. In some instances, they would need very sk highly skilled labor. And uh, on the other hand, they would also need um, unskilled labor. Uh, but then, uh, most industries tend to locate um, in larger cities because that is where they can access uh, labor who are usually unskilled. Uh, because most of these factories do not need very highly uh, skilled labor. But then, when they have to do more technical things, then they would need some uh, highly skilled labor to complement the majority of um, uh, workers who are unskilled. Um, productivity and workers' attitude are also important, you know, um, in relation to a company's choice of labor. Uh, there are instances where labor engage in all sorts of agitations, and that affects uh, productivity. So if a company is going to locate somewhere, they will look at the general attitude of the people. If they are the type who can, uh, can easily are uh, always um, engaging in industrial actions, uh, which is popularly known as strikes or all sort of uh, labor agitations, then these companies would not locate there. But if they find the labor easy to work with, then they would always uh, go to locate there. So labor is a very important thing um, in terms of uh, the location of industries. And then the next one is also uh, transport. Transportation is a very important thing. In the 19th century, transport was seen as a major uh, factor in determining the location of industries in the sense that people always wanted to uh, access cheap transport. So some would even locate close to canals or uh, rivers or streams where they can easily uh, transport their goods from one place to the other uh, cheaply. Um, places with good transport networks, such as good uh, road networks, um, railway networks, tend to attract more industries. So in in places where these things are absent, then it will be very difficult to attract um, transport uh, businesses there. Uh, in some tropical um, countries, which are predominantly uh, in the developing countries, many businesses have not been able to thrive because of the poor transport infrastructure 
in such places. And therefore, it is uh, important for people to take this uh, into consideration when they need to um, are, are concerned about the development of their um, communities. Market, uh, which I mentioned earlier on, um, most industries tend to locate a business near the market tend to reduce transport cost and at the same time um, reduces the time that is used in delivery of uh, products to consumers. Um, improved transportation and refrigeration have made the factor less uh, necessary in uh, industrial location because um, Today, with the improvement of transportation, people can move fast from one place to the other. So uh, there's no need to really locate close to the market. And then with refrigeration, because many of these um, industries that tend to locate to the market uh, produces perishable uh, products. So if you have very good transport system, then there's nothing to fear about. So th this shows the dynamics or the changing uh, phase of uh, uh, the market in recent times. Another thing that would also affect the location of companies is government policies. Governments tries to influence the location of uh, companies by providing them certain incentives. And what are these incentives? Um, uh, redu uh, the reduction of taxes, um, construction of uh, uh, roads or other infrastructure that would uh, enhance the free movement of uh, companies, uh, provide them with grants, um, rent-free periods, and also training of workers. I mean, the list are endless. But then for certain uh, reasons government can also introduce certain obstacles that will prevent people from locating a certain areas and this could be uh, refusing of uh, planning permission to uh, for people to establish their businesses close or within national parks green belts or residential areas we all know that some industries pollute the environment they uh, they are a form of health hazards to people and therefore if they allow them to locate in uh, residential areas for example it would be uh, a, pr uh, a source of problem for the people living there so these policies are there to prevent them from uh, locating there yeah so now we will look at some of the theories of industrial location um, in fact, there are several theories of industrial location, uh, but one of the, uh, the prominent ones uh, which you can find in most literature is uh, the Alfred uh, Weber's uh, least cost theory. Alfred Weber uh, was a German uh, economist, and he argues that most favorable location of firms is one where the cost is uh, minimized or where the cost could be minimized. And he argued that the most important cost were transport cost. He actually identified three main costs. Um, apart from the transport cost, he also identified labor cost and agglomerative uh, cost. And agglomerative cost is usually um, talking about the cost that one can reduce when the uh, when they are located or a firm is located uh, together with several others within a certain place. If the company tends to distance itself from the others, then its cost could uh, go up. But when it is close to uh, other companies, then it's going to reduce the cost. Uh, on the other hand, if um, uh, the cost of labor is higher, it's also going to affect the company. So these are the kind of cost that Albert uh, uh, Weber identified. But then he considered the transport cost as one of the most important. But today, transport cost alone is not uh, important given the improvement of transportation. Because if one can move uh, goods and services um, very fast from one place to the other, that the costs 
aspect is minimal as compared to uh, the olden days or some hundred uh, years ago. Um, another important um, location theory is one uh, propounded by uh, August Loesch. And he started his argument by criticizing uh, Alfred Weber's uh, ideas that he overemphasized on the cost element. His uh, argument is mostly or uh, focused uh, more on the market aspect. He claims that Weber um, underplayed the importance of market. Uh, he noted that the optimum location of firm is where the largest possible market area could be monopolized or controlled. So if you take the entire country, you have to, for example, look at places where you think you can um, have a lot of uh, sales. So that's what he tries to emphasize on. So for example, if you go to the north where many people use bicycles and, uh, and motorbikes, he would uh, advise you to go to that area because that's where the market is. Majority of the people are using this kind of, uh, uh, this source of transportation. So the market demand would encourage firms in any uh, one industry to disperse across a region so that it could have control of its own market area. However, firms from different industries by uh, congregating together at the same location in any market area could also benefit from uh, agglomerative economies. And this is similar to uh, what I said earlier on. If all these um, um, industries are located close to the market, then there are so many things that they can enjoy. For example, they could, they could team up to have common advertising instead of um, uh, doing it individually, which would increase their cost. They could also uh, construct roads together. They could uh, employ the same or special uh, labor to do things for them uh, when they are located close to each other. But then a uh, major critique of um, Loge's work is that he failed to look at the political factor that is how government policies can affect the location of industries. So now that we've learned some theories of um, location of industries, let's look at the nature of manufacturing industries in the advanced and developing countries. So we, I have put this in the form of a table. So on my left hand side, you can see uh, the characteristics of uh, the developed uh, countries and that of the developing countries. For the developed countries, you can see that they have large scale manufacturing industries, while in the developing countries, they have small scale manufacturing industries. Beside that, in the developed countries, uh, they are dominated with uh, heavy industries while in the developing countries as light uh, industries, usually producing food and textiles. Uh, in the advanced countries, they, have, they use high technology, whilst in the developing countries, it's low technology. Production is largely for both uh, domestic and foreign markets in the developed uh, countries. But when you come to the developing countries, high proportions are produced and sold locally. So whereas in the developed countries, they look at dual markets, that's the foreign and international, in most developing countries, it's only for local consumption. And then raw materials are obtained locally. Whereas in the um, developing countries, we tend to import most of uh, our raw materials for our industrial products. And then in the developed country, they also use highly skilled uh, labor. And when you come to developing countries, it's only a few skilled personnel who are employed. So this gives us uh, the uh, characteristics um, indicating the differences of uh, industries in both the advanced and developing uh, countries. Now, it is important for us to also understand the reasons why small-scale industries are common in developing countries, especially in Africa. 
Um, one of the things that we can mention here is the lack of capital. There is a general lack of capital to set up heavy industries like iron and steel industries and oil refineries in developing countries. So in most cases, developing countries or companies in developing countries have to go abroad to access capital, right? And these business people are very few. So it also explains why such industries in developing countries are owned by expatriates because the locals do not have the capital to finance these kind of businesses. The other reason is also the use of local raw materials. The raw materials for small scale industries are obtained locally and they are usually available in abundance. So because of this accessibility, that's why um, you find many of such uh, small scale industries. And when it comes to labor, in the advanced countries we've learned that they use high, uh, highly skilled labor. But for such uh, small scale industries, the labor that uh, is required uh, is not the highly skilled one. So it is easy for them to uh, use this um, uh, type of labor in the developing world. And then when it comes to power, most small scale industries do not require a lot of uh, energy uh, to produce. So this um, explains the reason why we have uh, many small scale industries in the developing world. And the other factor is also market. Market for heavy uh, industries or heavy products are very small in the developing world. And therefore, it is uh, much prudent for people to go into uh, light uh, skilled uh, industries in the developing world. Having explained the reasons why we have um, many small scale industries in developing countries, uh, it's also important to talk generally about the factors that uh, manufacturing industries face in the developing world. We've talked about capital um, as an issue and it's the same problem. Um, when it comes to labor, it's also the same. And what is peculiar about the labor in developing countries is that um, the kind of education or the training that labor uh, is given in this part of the world emphasizes on the liberal uh, aspect of education rather than the technical aspects. Because for industries, you require a lot of um, technical knowledge. And most of our institutions or higher uh, learning institutions focus more on the liberal aspect. So people who are employed in these uh, industries do not um, have the requisite skills to operate. Beside that, we also have low quality of manufacturing goods. And the few manufacturing products that are produced cannot compete on the international market. So until we are able to produce very quality products, we cannot actually uh, compete very well on the international market. And this is one key uh, problem that is uh, facing manufacturing industries in the developing world. Um, another aspect is the poor terms of trade. Most developing countries um, do not um, get fair trade on the international market. And this is actually a, a problem. Um, when they produce their things to the international market, they are either not bought or they will be told that they don't meet a certain uh, specifications. So there are instances where these products are shipped back to the developing countries and not uh, getting any market in the advanced world. So these challenges are, are there. Uh, beside that, there's also poor infrastructure. Transport networks are um, not in abundance, so it uh, kind of affects their production, and as well as power supplies. Most developing countries do not have um, adequate or regular power supplies, and this actually affects them. Currently, Ghana is going through such a crisis. We don't have enough energy to power our industry. So all these uh, affect um, the manufacturing industries. 
Beside that, we also have small markets. Um, this is due to the low population as well as the income levels. You know, although um, we can learn from um, other sources that populations in developing countries are increasing uh, from time to time, when it comes to the markets, we have very small markets and that affects uh, productivity or the people who intends to produce for the market. Beside that, the income levels of people are very low, so they are not able to save more and in order to invest into manufacturing activities. And the other factor is corruption. Corruption is endemic in many uh, developing countries. Monies that could be used to develop industries end up in individuals' uh, pockets, so these industries don't get to thrive at the end of the day in these uh, um, countries or communities. A number of um, solutions have been tabled you know, um, towards the uh, problems that many manufacturing companies f uh, face in the developing world. Um, one of them is uh, effective capital mobilization. It is argued that if companies or industries are able to find an effective way to mobilize capital, then the issue of uh, capital could be reduced. I mean, the key thing about accessibility to capital is that when these uh, manufacturers or entrepreneurs go to the banks to borrow money, they don't have the collateral which could be used as security to back them. So people are saying that if they can find different ways, you know, through maybe community self-help projects or through uh, micro industry. So they need to find more effective ways to uh, generate capital to finance their businesses. Others who are arguing that we can introduce technical courses if the education that we provide to uh, people are more on the liberal aspect, then we need to introduce more technical education which will train people uh, to uh, provide labor for industries. And others are also arguing that um, a way to solve the, this problem is to develop our uh, infrastructure, such as uh, provide better roads, uh, provide uh, reliable electricity supply to uh, communities so that they can use them um, to manufacture their products. The next one is also to be able to exploit foreign markets because most of the products that are produced here are sold locally and if we are able to sell our products uh, on the international market we tend to earn a lot of foreign exchange which can also be used to expand industries locally. So the argument is that for industries to thrive in developing countries then there's the need to uh, be able to sell on the international market. And the last, um, or oh, another point that has been raised is the ability to fight corruption. If developing countries are not able to fight corruption, then the, they, they have a long way to go in the industrialization uh, journey or agenda. So now we would look at industrialization in Ghana. And for this, we'll start by looking at industrialization during the colonial period. Um, development of modern industries in Ghana started only after the uh, Second World War. Uh, before the 1950s, the government did not establish manufacturing industries uh, or manufacturing units, neither did it encourage private uh, individuals to uh, develop industries. We had uh, a few industries available, but then the, these manufacturing industries were owned by the government, and their primary focus was for the maintenance of uh, uh, infrastructure such as roads, uh, railways, the harbor, and telecommunications. So when you look at this, uh, uh, manufacturing activities, they were not necessarily for 
direct economic gains, but rather to support certain industries uh, or activities uh, in terms of their survival, because uh, some of them would produce, let's say, parts for the uh, railways, uh, would produce um, um, things for the uh, road networks and telecommunications. So it was just to sustain these um, infrastructure rather than to provide direct gains to the uh, economy. Yes, but then um, after the uh, period of um, colonization, um, the country decided to go on the path of industrialization. Um, the CPP government uh, was very determined to accelerate, uh, accelerate Ghana's uh, development um, by uh, first encouraging private businesses to um, establish manufacturing companies. But then it got to a point where the government found that it cannot depend solely on uh, private industry. So the government set aside large sum of money for infrastructure and for direct investment in industry. So this led to the uh, establishment of many manufacturing uh, companies uh, across the length and breadth of uh, uh, Ghana. In the north, we saw the um, tomato factory, we saw the meat factories. Uh, if you come to Ashanti region, we had the, uh, the leather factory. Uh, if you come to the western region, they had the Aboso glass factory, for example. Uh, in the central region, we had the Commander sugar factory. So all these uh, industries uh, came out after independence. Um, beside that, we also had the uh, Volta River project, um, which uh, saw the uh, uh, development of industrial estates in uh, Accra, Tema, Takradi, and Kumasi. The government also initiated the development of the 20 rural industrial development centers. So it meant that the industrialization um, in, ter uh, in terms of uh, geography was not only in the urban areas but as well as in the rural areas. Uh, from the 19 uh, or mid 1970s, the government began to pay attention to small scale industries. And this was captured in the 1975-1979 development plan. Uh, privatization of state-owned industries under the IMF, uh, supported by the economic recovery or the structure adjustment program, came out in the 1980s. So this actually shows some changes or uh, dynamics in uh, manufacturing or industrial activities in Ghana. This shows that before the 1983, majority of the industries were state-owned. But through this uh, program, the Structural Adjustment Program, many of these uh, manufacturing companies were privatized. So it went into the hands of private individuals. Now, we can also talk about some structural characteristics of manufacturing in Ghana. Now. Let's look at the size of enterprises. They are dominantly or predominantly small-scale establishment. And often they employ less than 10 workers. So it tells you that they are very small. You can even describe them as micro-industries. And many of the workers were paid less uh, income. Some did not receive any income because some could be owned by family or could be family businesses, so to say. And they, uh, apart from being um, family businesses, they could also be uh, owned by a very small group of people. But with regards to the types of goods produced and their total contributions to manufacturing, we can say that in the 1980s especially, there were three types of sectors that dominated the manufacturing sector. Uh, these were the wood products, um, industries, the food and beverages, and the textiles industries. These were the three thing, uh, three key areas that uh, were very common in the country. Um, in terms of ownership, 
um, we saw that there were state-owned enterprises, there were private-owned enterprises, and in some instances, we also had joint state and private enterprises, as well as cooperatives. Um, up until the 1980s, the state dominated the manufacturing sector, but in 2003, uh, private-owned enterprises contributed 94.7 of the total manufacturing employment, while the state contributed only 1.2%. Uh, so it tells you that the ownership of manufacturing has uh, shifted uh, tremendously from the uh, government to the private uh, individuals or private owners. So this indicates an appre appreciable reduction of the contribution of the state as an employer in the uh, industrial sector. Now, we can also look at the industrial location and location dynamics in Ghana. Um, there, there are regional variations when it comes to the pattern of manufacturing and employment. Um, the, there are small scale establishment in general, more dispersed through the regions. So these are largely industries that are clearly specially associated with ultimate uh, consumers and local materials. Uh, what this means is that they uh, provide, they deal directly with consumers. Um, instead of perhaps um, dealing with intermediaries here and there. They include food and beverages, furniture, repair services, perishable uh, foodstuffs such as bread and pastries. Other products uh, with low value per weight, such as uh, per unit weight, such as concrete blocks, pottery, earthware, manufacturing. Some products also add bulk uh, weight of manufacture, uh, manufacturing, hence uh, have relatively high transport cost. Um, some are also re uh, related to dispersed activities such as agriculture. An example is rice and corn milling. Uh, for others, there are medium and large scale industries and are comparatively discrete in pattern of location. And when we talk of uh, discrete pattern of location, it means that these are carefully planned areas uh, for these uh, activities to take place. And then we also have large scale industries that are more discrete in both uh, location and type of uh, activities. Most of them are also um, are actually located in Greater Accra, uh, Western and Ashanti regions. That is the location of most of the manufacturing I industries that we have in the country. Um, in the Western region, most of the industries are located in Sekendi, Takrade, in Sefi, and then Amenfi, Awin districts. And Greater Accra, they are in the Accra metropolitan areas, and that contains about 96% of all manufacturing units in the region. So it tells you that Accra and Kumasi, in Accra and uh, Tema, are the main uh, hub of uh, manufacturing activities in the region. Kumasi is the main industrial center in the Ashanti region as well. Yeah, but then it is also important for us to try to understand why is it that we have many of these um, industries located in the metropolitan areas because we are told that uh, the industries are in Accra, Kumasi and Sekendita Kradi, and these three cities are metropolitan uh, areas. Um, some of the reasons that can be attributed to this is the nearest to the ports. When you come to Tema, we have a port there. If you come to Takradi, there is a port. So with the ports, they are able to access raw materials from abroad, and also when they have finished production, they can easily uh, export them through the ports. Besides that, these um, cities are also huge in terms of population, and therefore they have a bigger market in these three uh, uh, metropolitan areas. So the market is there for them. Besides that, they can have adequate transport and communication facilities in these uh, areas. So that is another 
uh, reason for the concentration of um, industries there. They also have available uh, labor for them. It doesn't mean that when you go to other areas you don't have labor over there, but the high concentration of industries in this place automatically attracts uh, uh, labor so they can easily get them over there. They also have sources of power, electricity in these areas to power the industries. This again doesn't mean that when you go to the other areas they don't have sources of power. It's just that these places have become uh, an industrial hub and therefore it attracts people and they have the infrastructure available for them. And the last point is also government policy. We all know that um, the government, for example, developed Tema as an industrial area. If you come to Accra, we have the industrial area there. In Sekenita Accra, they, they have a similar one. So through these government policies, they are able to attract uh, a lot of businesses there, that is the manufacturing businesses there to operate. So this tells us the reasons why we have many uh, businesses in our country. Yeah. Now we let's look at the regional distribution of industrial units and employment. Um, first, let's look at uh, the 1987 industrial census, which was carried out in uh, in the various regions. Um, in this report, we can see that Greater Accra region dominates in terms of manufacturing units. Uh, in operation and also employment. So in terms of manufacturing units, Greater Accra has 31%. And then when it comes to the employment, it employs 39% of labor. In the Ashanti region, it is 29% uh, in terms of manufacturing units and 22.5% in terms of um, the employment. Yeah, at the bottom here is Upper West region. And here, in terms of manufacturing unit, it only has 0.7%. And then when it comes to uh, manufacturing uh, employment, it only employs 0.4%. So it is the lowest uh, in the country uh, based on this uh, statistic. I'm looking at this uh, from uh, the year 2003. Uh, in the industrial census, Greater Accra still tops with 25.5% and had a slight edge over Ashanti, which had 24% in terms of the number of establishment, that is manufacturing establishment. Greater Accra also contributed 27.9% of manufacturing employment relative to Ashanti, which contributes 24.3%. Uh, but generally, you could see that the performance of uh, Greater Accra and Ashanti region are quite close. Upper West uh, region made the least contribution again, with 1.6% and 1.2% of total industrial units and total manufacturing employment respectively. So this tells you that uh, there's much to be done in that part of uh, the country in terms of um, industrial establishment and also employment. Um, having talked about um, this, we can also look at the benefits of development of manufacturing industries in Ghana. Manufacturing industries serve as a source of revenue, and we can see this in terms of taxes paid by industries which are used in the development of the country. As, uh, there's also a law that uh, compels uh, uh, employees to pay taxes just like their uh, uh, employers. So they would also pay taxes, and this money will go to the state. So that's uh, uh, one point. Uh, the other one is also about a uh, uh, source of foreign exchange, that many of the products that are produced by these industries are sent abroad or exported abroad. And uh, in this process, the government can earn uh, some money from this. Uh, it's usually through taxes. Um, another point is also the diversification of the economy. 
traditionally, we all know that many developing countries are agrarian, and Ghana is uh, a typical example. So with the introduction of industries, then it means that the country is diversifying its economy. Right? So this uh, um, helps to reduce um, our reliance on agriculture, and it would also serve as a main source of uh, foreign exchange because most of the agrarian goods do not earn uh, higher revenue as compared to the, or monies as compared to the manufactured uh, goods. The other point is also uh, that it serves as a source of employment. Uh, as you've seen in the previous slides, uh, there are um, statistics on uh, employment in manufacturing, and this uh, actually confirms that, that uh, the manufacturing industry employs a lot of uh, people, uh, which helps um, with the national <coughs> development. And then the, ter the last point is that it helps to develop the agriculture sector. And this is by producing farm implements and serving as market for agricultural goods. Um, I'd like to explain the, f uh, the point on um, farm implements. Many, many of the um, agricultural uh, industries or farms generally use a lot of um, inputs. And many of these inputs are coming from the um, manufacturing sector. It could be fertilizers, it could be machinery, right? So they actually support the agricultural industry and also help with the marketing of uh, agricultural goods. In summary, we've seen uh, in this lecture or we've uh, learned that uh, about industrialization as a term and a concept. We've also uh, learn about the classification of industry and factors that affect the location of industries. Um, another thing that we've learned is uh, theories on industrial location and this has helped us to understand why certain industries will locate uh, in certain areas. Um, the key things that we've learned here is about the cost element and also the importance of the market in the sense that industries will tend to locate close to the market, which would uh, reduce their cost. And then the last bit is also about the global nature of industrial activities, including the geography of uh, industrial uh, manufacturing in Ghana. So um, for our sample questions, we have two. The first one is, what is industrialization, and why is it important to national development? And the second one is compare and contrast industrialization in the advanced and developing worlds. So we will discuss uh, these two questions um, either uh, during tutorials or when we meet in the lecture room. So these are our references for this lecture taken from CAR 1990. Uh, Yangsen 2013 and Rhetoric uh, 2001. So this uh, brings us to the end of our lecture for today. Thank you. <laughs>